Kundi ako magtatrabaho pa na tayo. Akong bahala. Bakit ka pa talaga nandito? Malaman ko na ayaw akong magulat sa kanya. Ano bang magagawa mo para sa akin? Diba kung kodo ako siya sabi ni Vincent? Victor. Victor. Kamali ka, mapapatay ka. Kaya ko yan. Nanay! Nanay! Nasa TV ka! Hindi ako yan. Wala pang isang buwan na namatay si tatay kung sino-sino na yung lalaki tinatrabaho niyo! Kaya yeah, mapulis kami! Servisyo para sa bayan. Trabaho kong linisin ng bansa. Ewan ka na, hindi ka na kaya. Mga anak mo lang ang dapat mong isipin. Ano ginawa mo, Nay? Pinatay mo sila. All right. Can you see me here? Let me see if I can start my... Your, there you are. What's up, Ben? Hey, dude. Doing good, Jeff. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for talking to me today about watch list. No, thanks for having me. Let me see if I can get a little bit more light in here just to... to sure. Always the director. Look at this. Always the director. <laughs> Maybe this works. Oh, uh, man. It must be hot there if it's hot here. 113 to 115 for the next 10 days. Wow. Yeah, oh so God. we just don't go outside. You go out before, even at 9 in the morning, it's like 108. I mean, it's just insane heat wave going on right now in Las Vegas. Unbelievable. That's too much. I mean, at least you have air conditioning everywhere. I mean, that's Yeah, but bad. after a while, it, it just, it, it's heavy. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it feels recycled. It's just awful. It's just... But I'm a native, so, but this is, this is a bad, we've had like two or three weeks uh, this summer where we've had streaks of heat waves like this, so. Oh, you know. wow. So 100, 100 degrees, yeah. not hot to me. 105, not hot, you know, but when you get to 110, 115, <laughs> it's, it's dangerous. Where are you at, right? Where are you at? I'm in, I'm in West LA, so it's yeah. still about, uh, you know, breaking triple digits, but yeah, nowhere, nowhere near out there. I mean, they said, what, yesterday it got to 130 and, and. Uh, Death Valley, which is Probably. like, yeah, That's, which is a, a record for. I think it set a record, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's no climate change. This is normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for talking to me today. I watched Watch List, like I say, ah. right? and uh, I'm very political, and so I'm very aware of what's going on in the Philippines with Durante and all that. And I really went into this movie with zero expectations. I really didn't know what it was about, and uh, it was just one of the most compelling. It's one of my favorite films I've seen this year. I'm not. Yeah, I'd wow. say it's fantastic. Thanks you know? so much. I really appreciate that. I mean, it's just, it's got everything. I mean, it's just not just about, you know, bringing an awareness to the, the death squads in the Philippines, um, but just the, the plight of Maria and her family. I mean, it's just a, what a wonderful film. If I can say the word Thanks wonderful. So, so um, how long have you been working in the independent film scene? I mean, it's been a long journey, I guess probably uh, 18 years now. Like I, I started... Uh, working for the Cohen brothers back in Oh Brother Where Art Thou, I was in the camera department as a camera intern, and that was 1999. So that was my first real, you know, like Hollywood job, I guess. Um, and then I That's kept awesome. in touch with. Yeah, it was incredible. Like <laughs> kinda... Cohen brothers, what a resume! I mean, for your first, job, I mean, that's fan. I'm yeah. a huge fan of the Cohen brothers, but that's paterfamilias. You know, I love Brother Where Art Thou. Big Lebowski fanatic, you know. So what a great way to start your career, huh? Well, I like those quotes that you're pulling out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was phenomenal. And then working, and then I kind of kept in touch with Clooney's team and went to work for him on the first film that he directed, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, and which was just phenomenal to see him at work and, you know, kind of be a fly on the wall. I was doing the behind the scenes for the DVD and then produced my first film. Real, real quick, Confessions yeah. of a Dangerous Mind. I did that junket in New York. Oh, really? Yeah, I did that junket, and I am uh, love the, um, George Barrett. Oh. Yeah, yeah. so, because the, the whole, uh, it was the, um, there was oh, the- Chuck Don Barris. Chuck Barris, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah. George Barris, he's the car guy. Uh, Chuck <laughs> Barris, he did um, the Gong Show movie when I was a kid, yes. you know, plus yes. the show. So when I saw him there, I was just like, and I saw Clooney and Drew, everybody was there. So that was a great experience too. And I'm also president of the Las Vegas Film Critics Society. And we gave okay. best picture that year to Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. We were like the only ones. Yeah, wow. so I remember at the Critics' Choice Awards, I went up to uh, Harvey Weinstein and say, hey, I'm Jeff Howard, you know, uh, president of the Las Vegas. But we gave, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's right. And just ignore, <laughs> mouthful of food. Weinstein just, 
Oh yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. No, thank you. No, I was just like, so that was my only contact with Harvey Weinstein was that one moment. I was just That's like, probably oh. a good thing that that. Yeah, was yeah. Like, I'm like, what a jerk. Story doesn't age the same way anymore. But uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry. to Continue. Confession. No, no. So yeah, so I worked on that film, and you know, I went to film school at NYU, but working on on those kind of bigger budget films was much more of an education of how a film set runs in Hollywood and. And after that, I was able to, you know, work on my first independent film, Bomb the System, that I produced um, out of film school that was about graffiti writers in New York and went to Tribeca and we sold it to Palm Pictures. And so it's been a long journey of these, you know, kind of independent films and, you know, working outside the system and, and more recently doing these international films. You know, I did this film in the Philippines and then I did a film before this called The Ashram that we filmed in India with, uh, you know, Oscar winner Melissa Leo and Cal Penn. And so kind of seeing that there's really interesting ways to put projects together outside of the mainstream system, which has kind of moved into just big Marvel movies and Lucasfilm films. And, you know, this kind of more intimate style production uh, really exists in the independent space. So I'm excited to, to keep working on them just because I feel like that's where you can really say something different. Whoops, I think I lost you there. Oh, but I got it. There we go. I recently spoke to Dean Devlin. Um, he produced his series Almost Paradise uh, exclusively in the Philippines, one of the first American productions. And he mm. said the people in the crew were the best and the most kind ever in the Philippines. He wanted to hire locally. And I was wondering, what was your experience with, with the people of the Philippines in shooting the movie? Yeah, similar. Like some of the most welcoming people I've ever met and worked with and just very like optimistic and heartfelt people very like welcoming and so I had a fantastic experience uh, working out there and just very like technically skilled too you know like amazing talent in front of the camera and behind the camera and so it's a it's a thriving local industry it's about you know on the ground there like half the films that release are international and the other half are local and so there's a there's a huge local community and it was basically just me and my cinematographer that came in from abroad everyone else was filipino well talk about the challenges of shooting in the philippines i mean the weather the slums at night the long shoots i mean was there was it was it uh was it worth what you went through to shoot this movie because i i assume this is one of the biggest okay. productions that they've had uh you know because you you use all real locations yeah, it was. It was it was extremely difficult making this film. I mean, not only the subject matter being, you know, sort of about extrajudicial killings and being slightly critical of what the government is doing out there so that we had to shoot under the radar that a lot of this was, you know, kind of uh, not wanting to be discovered about what the story was about and having like a fake script, you know, for those that asked and, and stuff like that. But the physical challenges, you know, they film in a totally different way in the Philippines where all of the equipment and all of the crew is on a 24 hour hire for like a flat fee. And so you shoot for 24 continuous hours and then take a day off and it's 24 on and 24 off. And so it was really brutal, um, you know, trying to operate in that environment. And then, yeah, like you said, shooting in the real locations, like early on, there was a discussion about whether we should shoot on a film set versus, you know, to try and be safer. And I just, felt that it wouldn't have the same authenticity as if we shot on the real streets. And it's funny because it, there's the fascist theme in the movie because the Philippines has a democratic republic, but people are labeled. Uh, there's a drug watch list, secret police desk squads. They target the poor and the corruption. Uh, all that's going on today, but you're shooting a movie that's that's shining a light on this. So would you, we ever worried for your safety? The word would get out that you're making this literally an anti-propaganda film for the government? Uh, I was at first, you know, like I was very nervous about going into another culture and, and doing a story that was local and, and, you know, like, like we said, quite controversial. And so I, you know, wanted to make sure that we surrounded ourselves with people that believed in the story and what we were doing, but also that could act as sort of a checks and balances for the, for the realism. You know, my bigger fear was, you know, getting the story wrong or getting the, the facts wrong because, especially as an outsider coming in, what could be more disrespectful? And so we worked really, really hard to do our homework on every little detail and the authenticity because I knew that we'd be under a microscope, uh, especially as foreigners. 
And so for me, the, the guiding principle was always authenticity and realism. And I felt like as long as we were telling the story truthfully, especially for the people that are suffering through this travesty, uh, that it would be doing, you know, its service and justice. And, and one the reoccurring theme that throughout the film was that the Filipino people all were against anyone that had any kind of drug problem. You know, they were labeled, you know, so they couldn't get a second chance. They, they were always had a stigma around them. Unlike in America where we feel, look, it's, it's a chemical problem. It's a health problem. They see it as something differently. So when Maria's trying to get a job, she goes, aren't you the one on the news? Get out, you know, just like uh, going on and on like that. Do you think this film might change a lot of the Filipino attitude once they see this? You know, you, you kind of hit it on the head with the stigma that follows people around. I mean, you know, you, you could say we have that to a certain extent here in certain communities where you, if you're a drug addict or a criminal that it follows you around for the rest of your life. I mean, certainly here it's hard to get a job as, as an ex-con. But, you know, the kind of there is a, a deep faith. Uh, in the community out there and, you know, it's 90% Catholic. And so I think they view it as more of uh, a sin if you've, you know, experimented with drugs, whereas here it can be part of your past and you can still have worth as a person moving forward. Um, it is a lot more challenging there with the stigmas. And so I hope that, you know, these types of films can raise that discussion. Like I would never be so uh, bold to say that it would change views, but if it can you know, force us to examine our own prejudices, then that's really the purpose of cinema. Is well, it to, shows is them as human beings. It shows Maria and her family. It shows they're no different than anyone else, you know, so, and they won't give a second chance. Even she goes, look, we've been on the list. We got, we were clean now. We've been rehabilitated and it still didn't matter. You know, almost like you say, you can compare it to an ex-con here in America. Anyone who's an yeah. ex-con who comes out, regardless, you just kind of like, ooh, get away from me. You know, there's no chances for them. But the other thing that, that surprised me, or I said it was featured in the film, the abject poverty of the family. I mean, they are literally on the wrong side of the tracks <laughs> when I saw that. And just showing this mother's struggle uh, with her family and with her trying to make ends meet. And when your back is against a wall, she has to turn and do the most, you know, the most destructive thing that, she, that she's totally against. Yeah. So just seeing Maria struggle constantly, you know, because I... You know, when she became an informant, I thought, okay, she's going to be a rat. And without giving any spoilers away, unbelievable what she put through it. Every time she did something for the police or she did something against her her conscience, I mean, it really took effect on her. And was it uh, Ale Alestra? I can't even say her name. Alessandra. Alessandra de Rossi. Wow. What a performance. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, she's incredible. And, you know, we really knew that the, the film would rest on uh, her shoulders and, and her performance because, as you kind of alluded to, the character goes through some pretty dramatic transformations and not all of them, you know, pretty. And so the fact that you'd have a, a lead character that kind of breaks a lot of the rules of, of storytelling in the West, which is they can't do this and they have to be likable, um, we knew knew that we were going to push this character into some pretty dark corners. And so the fact that you might not necessarily agree with what she's doing, but you understand where she's coming from and why she feels like it's the, the only option that she has. And yeah, I think like, you know, the police brutality and, you know, the kind of mention that you, that they're targeting this one community of basically poor people is very similar to what's happening in, in here and in, in this country and yeah, kind of shows that police brutality. Yeah. Democracy in it yeah. Because they don't touch the rich people. They don't touch the corruption in the police department. You know, they, they're, they're selling this stuff to the poor people and then they're killing them for doing exactly what they're being told to do. You know, so yeah. it's just, I mean, how in the world is reform going to happen with all of that? I mean, it's just. It seems yeah. Like well, the thing that struck me about the, the political makeup of the Philippines is that it's very similar to here in that it's polarized. You have half the people that are against the president and half the people that are for him. And the idea that we're making this bargain with our elected, elected officials, which is if you give me your freedom, I will keep you safe. And that's a very dangerous road because, you know, you can say in the name of national security, we want to be tough on crime. We want to like keep all of us safe, but you use that to start oppressing people. And that's a, a really dangerous road to go down. And also use the theme of family throughout the film. It was his name's Miko as Mark. I mean, he was the kingpin or the, I should say the, the, the pillar for Maria and the family. And even mm -hmm. he, you know, towards the end of the movie just started to buckle under the pressure. It, what an amazing actor he was. He was fantastic. 
and it was all of 13 years old when he did it. It's phenomenal to watch. I mean, you know, you talk about the theme of family. I think at its most basic, this is a story of a mother trying to protect her children, which is a very primal instinct. And, you know, what lengths would you go to protect your family? Would you inflict harm on others if it meant saving your own? And these are some moral questions that, you know, I think are stirring within all of us. And and so in the end, you know, even though she is, is pushed to do some pretty intense things, it's really always in her heart is that this is for my children. And that kind of blurs the line between what's right and wrong. And she was making so much money doing all the informing for the police. I wonder why she never moved out of that shack. It was driving me crazy. I was waiting for her to say, Look, I'll do one more job, but get me an apartment, give us a better life. Cause she already crossed that line. Right. So she, yeah. there was no, she couldn't argue with herself, but she was always staying in that shack on the railroad tracks. I'm like, okay, you've done three jobs for them. You got all this money. You're paying for tuition, get a better place. But she never did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it all just happened too fast. It was just within the course of a month or two. And that duct tape scene, that was that was really brutal. Tell me about how you did that because it looked it almost looked too real. Yeah. Um, so you know, a lot of the killings that have happened out there are what they call summary executions, where they pick someone up off the street, put them into a van, and then no one sees them again until two days later and they end up, you know, like in the poster you have there with their with their face wrapped. Do they really leave and, a note on top of the body saying I was a drug dealer? Don't be like me. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Like, like basically just, you know, a warning to others like, yeah, don't copy me. Like I deal drugs. This is what happens to you. And that's, that's really how the, the drug war started, you know, or these extrajudicial killings was that you'd find these people on the street and it's, uh, it's horrific because you don't, you know, really think about what happened in that time from when they were kidnapped to when they appeared dead. And a lot of it is, you know, trying to get information about other drug dealers or, you know, silencing people that might have information that's indicting of the police, in, in which case that's what we used in the film. And you, you talked about how we shot that scene. I, I realized as we were shooting it, I was like, you know, without a drop of blood, this is, you know, perhaps one of the most violent scenes ever filmed just because you're watching someone, you know, plead for their life while, they're, while their face is getting taped up. And it's, it's a pretty intense moment. And, you know, we, we actually went with a stunt man who could also act um, so that, you know, we could actually do the taping in a way that was safe, but it was pretty intense. Like there were moments where, you know, after we start, we filmed the scene that he'd be like, oh, 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 give me some scissors. And like, we had to cut him out of there and stuff. But it was really that people were uh, open to going that far to, to tell the story truthfully, that it has that authenticity to it, you know. And uh, you were lucky to have a premiere in February before the pandemic took over the world. Tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. We released the film in, in the Philippines nationwide on February 19th. And it played in 40 theaters. We had uh, our premiere out there and, and did a lot of press for it. It was right around the time. I mean, they were taking our temperature going in and out of buildings back then. And I think because Southeast Asia has already had a few pandemics over the past 10 years that they were more prepared to, to deal with it. But, uh, you know, it's it was the film that was critically acclaimed and, and kind of, you know, a lot of people saw but uh is not your kind of romantic drama or action film that they're used to so i assumed you hightailed it out of the philippines back to america after that premiere yeah 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 I, i'd be I, really I, concerned you might be visited at midnight by some government officials going <laughs> you know I, yeah it was it was a concern i always used to joke that like we'd be you know able to show the film there but we would never be invited back and I mean, luckily, it's still a democracy and this is still the freedom of speech and expression. And so while it might have ruffled some feathers, I don't think, uh, you know, to me, it was the actors that took the real risk and the producers because I came in and I left, but but they lived there. And so the fact that they were willing to throw their weight behind this and, and give it all that they did uh, meant a lot. And I always had the fantasy growing up, you know, like, look, we could take care of so much crime if we had secret police who just went around and only killed the criminals. But in your film, it shows that even if one innocent person is, is killed because of the secret police, just like the death penalty, if you have one innocent person killed, it's a flawed system. You can't do it. And in this movie and watch list, you know, they, they kill the wrong people or they kill them for different reasons and additional things, you know. So, yeah, secret police and death squads is yeah definitely not a good idea. Well, and that's sort of like the debate that you bring up is is one that we're having the world over, which is you could argue on the one hand that it's made things safer, like there's less crime in the street, you don't have to worry about your purse getting snatched, and it's cleaned up, 
uh, crime and drugs. On the other hand, it's with brute force and it's above the law and, and no one should be above the law. And you're, you're playing judge, jury and executioner all in, all on the street. And so, you know, we tried to paint that image from both uh, sides of the debate with the characters so that they'd have these kind of, um, you know, moment, like exchanges where you could kind of understand that point of view of like, you got to, you know, rule with a hard fist and be tough on crime and send a strong message to these to these criminals. And on the other hand, it's like, but you're killing them. And, and so there's no second chance. There's no reforming possible. Um, and it's a really scary, you know, idea that this could happen in a democracy where, you know, people voted him into power and he promised to kill 100,000 drug dealers. And now it's 27,000 people dead and, and no explanation. And he doesn't learn from America where our war on drugs has, has failed with the hundreds of billions of dollars and people locked up for a handful of marijuana or it, it, we realize it's, it's a it's a health problem, you know, to look at it from a different from a different attitude and even prohibition going back to the 1930s. Nothing ever works. Law enforcement, you can't legislate morality. You have to do it from a medical side. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's so yeah. many things. Your film is is so many different layers to this movie you could talk about. So, and we have. So, I just think it's one of my favorite films of the year. And congratulations! And uh, can't wait to see what you do, what you do next. Thanks, Jeffrey. I really appreciate it. It's a uh, it's a pretty emotional film, and you know, for fans of world cinema or you know who like movies in general, hopefully this is one where you don't see the twists and turns coming up until even the last five or ten minutes. It's 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 chock full of surprises. Well, I had to tell you there are multiple times in the film where I was tearing up out of just wow. sheer. I mean, you know, just I don't want to give away any spoilers, but you just it all involved her and families. I was just like, you know, just you were you were her. <laughs> you you were like in her mind and uh, she was better than that. And so just an incredible film. So thank you so much for talking to me today and I wish you the best of luck with it. Thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate having me.